I'm David Abel. I'm chair of the Verde Exchange, and in partnership with Future Build and ULI uh, LA, we really welcome you today. And to you've only finished half of the days of panels. There's another 12, 15 to go. Um, but I wanted to turn to the luncheon plenary and introduce our two guests um, because they're very special people. One's uh, both of them are returning to Verde Exchange. Steve Wesley was with us last year. There was seem to be a little lull in the in the occasion of Verde, Verde Exchange last year at the end of January because it followed by a week the inauguration of, of a president who didn't seem to be totally aligned with some of the panels and panelists and energy and uh, direction that had been followed federally and, and certainly not with California. But I think Steve turned everybody around with a little reality therapy about what was actually happening in the global economy as, economy as well as California's economy. So I'm going to take a minute because we introduced him last year with his background and then I want to turn to CPUC Commissioner Carla Peterman who again has been with us many years and um, she just succinctly put into five sentences her resume which I, it's not fair but I'll read that to you in a second. But Steve Wesley. Steve is the founder and managing partner of the Wesley Group. He and his partners have built one of the larger clean tech sustainable venture firms in the U.S. with close to 300 million under management. The Wesley Group focuses on capital efficiency, high growth companies and sustainability, the shared economy and the Internet of Things. The firm has a few blue chip uh, investors including Citibank, Eon and South Korea Telecom. The company has wisely invested in 33 portfolio companies, three of which have gone public on NASDAQ, including Tesla Motors. The net IRR on the investments Mr. Wesley has led is a small piddling 42% with a 1.35x cash on cash return. So he comes with some credibility. Um, Steve was also the controller of the state of California, um, which is not insignificant, so he understands the public and private side, and not on his resume, he was student body president of Stanford, and so all the UCLA, Caltech, uh, UCLA and uh, USC people take notice. And there's a few of those student body presidents out here as well, Steve. So Steve, you'll come up first, but then I'm going to do Carla's uh, right now as well. Carla is commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission. Um, she's uh, assigned as commissioner for the Renewable Portfolio Standard, the Alternative Transportation, and the Energy Storage Proceedings. Not, unrelevant, not irrelevant to most all of our panels yesterday and some today. She's had previous positions with the California Energy Commission as a commissioner, as a researcher at the University of California Energy Institute and Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, lab, and we've had Dr. Bundell with us from the Chancellor's Office over all those labs yesterday and today. And she's been, interestingly, an investment banking associate at Lehman Brothers prior to that. So we have two excellent um, presenters, and I'll just summarize it this way. Steve is going to tell you the speed of velocity of this economy and its significance, and then the question will be asked, can the regulatory apparatus keep up with that speed, and Carl is going to answer that question succinctly. Steve. So I am fired up to be here today. How's everybody doing? Nobody runs a better conference than David Abel. We are living in an era of sustainable energy and resource efficiency, and this conference captures all of it. So what I'm going to do is give you a quick 15 or 20 minute world tour. We're going to touch down in China, India, France, England, New York City, and of course, California. I'm going to be as provocative as I can. I'm going to talk to you about how we are literally changing the world in California, where the global economy is coming, where you can make your next fortune, and what smart policymakers need to do to keep America and California at the forefront. That'll take 15 minutes. 
Then we're going to do four or five questions, and then we're going to go right into a fireside chat format with Commissioner Peterson, who is really one of the national, if not international, leaders in global energy policy. So buckle up. Let's get going. I want to start out with a quick story. I actually grew up in Los Angeles. I was born in Good Samaritan at the time. I remember we'd go to the beach, and when you went to the beach back then in the 60s, your mom would have to bring kerosene or turpentine with you because someone would have to wipe the tar off your feet when you went to the beach because of all the oil spills. So think about that. Every time you went to the beach, someone had to follow along with kerosene to get the tar off your kid's body. And why not? Because at the time, if you look back, nine of the 10 largest companies in the world, market cap wise, were six oil companies and three auto companies, with US Steel or GE bringing up the rear. It was an oil based economy. The oil and auto industry controlled the economy and frankly controlled government as well. That is all changing. After 40 years of extraordinary economic growth with China and now India following the excesses of America, we have a planet choking on pollution. Ponder this, and I was just in Beijing speaking at the Googleplex there. And on the front page of the paper, it said in the China Daily News, they'd just done a study that merely living in Beijing was the equivalent of smoking 52 cigarettes a day. So if you have a child, it is born with literally a two and a half pack a day cigarette habit. The Harvard Health Project projects over the next 25 years, 83 million people in China will die of uh, lung disease, 83 million people. India is in the process of passing China is the largest polluter in the world. The Chinese, to their credit, have begun a massive campaign to move towards solar and wind. China, by far the largest solar power in the world. By the way, I see a few people taking pictures. Have at it. Everything's open. If you want a copy, I'll send it to you. India is becoming the greatest challenge. But there's good news on the horizon. California started the parade 30 years ago, 40 years ago, in the 1970s. And what did we do that literally reshaped the global economy and began to make our energy cleaner after it was getting dirtier for decades in a row? Anybody remember? No? Yeah, it's catalytic converters. California unilaterally required the auto industry, if you want to sell cars in our state, you must make them cleaner. Detroit said, what, what are you, crazy? We, we can't make cars for different states. We forced their hand. Within a decade, every state in the country, every country in the world had followed California's model. Most people think there's a great battle going on amongst us between the carbon fuel industry and the renewables industry, right? I'm here to tell you that fight has already been waged and it's over. Renewable energy has already won. There's a global move to that. The real question is already what is happening next and I'm about to tell you. But let me start with a quick trivia question. Who here knows what year, you know, how far do we have to wait before the majority of the new power that's added to the electrical grid globally, not just in liberal California or Massachusetts, but globally, Africa, Asia, Europe, how many years is it before the majority of new power coming online globally is renewable energy? 30 years? 10? Three years ago, five years ago. Take a look at this chart. Carbon fuels already globally going down. Renewables coming on faster than anybody anticipated. And I am here to tell you right now, because the cost of renewable energy is going down so quickly, it does not matter whether you're Republican or Democrat or you somehow think coal is coming back. 
the whole world knows, except for 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the whole world knows we're going this direction. And it's happening inexorably, and it's driven by the global economy. So here's what's driving it. We all know the cost of solar wind is going down precipitously. You can see the graph on the top. Renewables are now below the cost of carbon fuels in virtually every part of the country. That is a stunning thing. They're not only cheaper, but they don't pollute. But the missing link is power storage. Full stop. Most of you know more or less, if you're in business at all, what the cost of a barrel of oil is. Anybody know? God bless you. 64. It, it's just what you need to know in the global economy. In the future, you will need to know what the cost per kilowatt hours of lithium ion batteries are. They are becoming ubiquitous. Most of my life, they've been about $2,000 a kilowatt right here. In the early 2000s, they dropped 50% to $1,000 a kilowatt. I was serving on the board of Tesla at the time. And this was such a dramatic thing. What it meant is for the first time, you could produce a very expensive, very cool electric car for rich people. <laughs> but what's happened here, if you look at it going down, it was going down literally 7 to 10% a year. And people said, oh my God, a new Moore's Law, you know, lithium ion batteries. Goes down. But here's where it gets interesting. Two years ago, it dropped, it's well below $100 a kilowatt hour, down from 1,000 just eight years ago. There is no way internal combustion vehicles can keep up. We are heading toward a world, get this, where people will no longer pay a penny for electricity or gasoline. Sorry, Southern California Edison. <laughs> this is a big shift. And I just want you to know that as this happens, you will see an inexorable move to electric vehicles. You will see power storage in every home. Vehicles will become batteries with wheels. They will be transferring power two ways. You will have a chance to make money selling uh, electricity back to the utility to help them arbitrage. This is a whole new world. What's stunning to me is people say, well, how quickly could this electric car thing really come? Because they're, they're, they're so expensive, I hardly see any on the road. It's coming faster than you know. I happen to be Norwegian, so I love this slide. God bless the Norwegians, stood up and said, by 2025, ban on oil and diesel vehicles. This is coming off a world that just a bit ago where the nine biggest companies in the world were oil and car companies. But there aren't many Norwegians, about four and a half million. My wife thinks it's too many. <laughs> India, 1.2 billion people choking in the worst pollution on the planet. They've stood up and said, we're moving all electric. All electric will be prohibited to sell diesel vehicles after 2030. England, France, the largest economies in the world lining up. America, missing in action. California, leading. We have just put in legislation now for a ban on oil and diesel vehicle sales by 2040. This is a fundamental shift. Four years ago, General Motors said we may see some hybrids in our future. Eight weeks ago, Mary Barra, General Motors' future is all electric. And right behind it, she said, and by the way, our business model at General Motors is changing. We won't be selling cars to individuals uh, in the future. In our vision, we will become the largest autonomous ride-hailing firm in the world. And the new number to keep in your mind is can we deliver people for $1.50 per mile? That is the new coin of the realm. I just want you to know this chart, which shows how quickly electric cars are coming, was based on the old battery numbers before the last ratchet down. Ponder this. A lot of you know Tesla has built this gigafactory. You know how big a Costco is, 100,000 square feet. The gigafactory 
is the size of 100 Costco's piled together, the largest building in North America. Volkswagen has said they will produce more batteries than Tesla times five. This is what's driving the global cost down. It's changing the economy as we know it. By the way, it now looks, after the business industry said, because California stood up as a global leader and said, we will require that 50% of the power utilities produced in this state is renewable. The business and industry said, we'll never get there to 50% production by 2030. It now appears that the utilities in this state, now I want to say, God bless you, SoCal Edison, we may be there as early as 2020. A goal once thought to be possible is now here 10 years early. Thanks to California's leadership. But that's just part of the story. What's next? This is what I want you to think about. We are now rapidly disintermediating every industry to create a new future. The energy industry, the auto industry, the building industry are all being disintermediated as part of a global city movement. By the way, the auto industry and the utilities and building industry, they didn't care about each other. They're all different. Now, they're becoming completely intertwined. And one of the reasons they're becoming intertwined is because they're under attack. By who? Silicon Valley, where I flew in from this morning. Let me tell you all about it. <laughs> Apple, Google, Amazon. The world's been turned upside down. Those oil companies and auto companies, they're all gone. One left in the top 10, Exxon. Number 10 and sinking like a stone in more ways than one. So who's displaced them? Of the 10 biggest market cap companies in the world, five of them are tech companies. All five are on the West Coast. Nothing left in New York, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago. That's the old world. Three are in Silicon Valley where I live. Uh, Google, Facebook, and Apple. The other two are in Seattle and Amazon rapidly heading for the number one position in the world. By the way, a quick story. One of my very best friends joined Amazon two years ago. He was the 100,000th employee. Last year, they sent him a note saying, congratulations, old timer. <laughs> You're in the first half of employees. We crossed 200,000 in a 14-month period. Now they're at 350,000. But they may be about to be overrun because filling out the top 10 are three of the fastest growing companies in the world, all Chinese tech companies, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent. What you must know is technology is eating the world. This is the future, and it is bringing renewable energy even faster, even faster than what I showed you. Again, while our CEO in the White House is asleep at the switch, coal is not coming back. The future is what is happening, and it is disintermediating everything. What you must know is, this is the new ethos. You must cannibalize your business before your competition does, or someone else will. Second, our whole new world going forward is going to be driven by new technologies like the Internet of Things. Cisco says 50 billion items. Every part of our lives, our home, our car, our work, ourselves, is going to be connected and new models like the sharing economy. This underlies and is driving our future, and you must understand it to be successful in the new economy. And the third thing you have to know, they're new customers. For the first time, think about this, the first time in 50 years, baby boomers, old guys like me, are no longer the largest buying cohort in the world. In 2017, millennials displaced them, the largest buyers in the world. And that's a big deal because their buying patterns are completely different. And you, we need to understand this. My generation, it's all about who can buy the biggest TV, the biggest car, the biggest house, and then we'll throw it out and buy a bigger one in 18 months. <laughs> that's all gone. Millennials are looking for three things. One. They want to see a smaller carbon footprint in everything they do. God bless you. Two, complete connectivity in every part of your life. Car, home, work, 
And three, they want to see companies with a higher purpose. Bad news for Exxon, great news for Google, Apple, and other firms if they do the right thing, on top of which is be careful with your data and maintain your trust. This is the new world we live in. New technology, new customers, future with a higher purpose. This is what energy looks like. And this is the energy of the last five years. Most people think this is the future. It's renewables and storage and fuel sales. This is already old news. Our investors, by the way, are the largest utility investors in the world. And I know some are here, like Chubu Electric, which is one of the leaders in Asia, SoCal Edison. This is the new energy. It's complete home energy automation. Blockchain. Blockchain? We now have the ability to do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading. The utilities, if they are not careful, could be left out of this entire mix. Everybody will be encouraged to be part of this new energy economy. IoT and lighting. There is a revolution in businesses, uh, in buildings. Every building in every country on the planet is moving from a dumb building to a digitized smart building. It appears now that the intelligence for buildings will be in the lighting. Your lights won't be lights anymore. They will have sensors. Sensors that help you save energy. Sensors that provide full mesh networking. Sensors that will tell you how many people are in every uh, room and help you manage your uh, source uh, or how many people you have in a building. It'll measure the quality of your air. Lights will make our buildings and our cities smaller. This is part of the new world we're in. And our vehicles, which is my favorite part, are changing quickly. We're moving from, self, uh, from driving vehicles to autonomous vehicles faster than anybody knows. Now, a lot of people say, well, when's all this going to happen? Well, who, who's going to make money doing this? I, I read about Solyndra. Um, you know, Mr. Romney said this stuff's never happening. If you look at the fastest growing companies in the world, you will see a disproportionate number that are in this resource efficiency mode. And these aren't just billion dollar unicorns. These are firms worth in the tens of billions of dollars. And the striking thing about this list, there's not one company here over 14 years old. And they're becoming the fastest growing companies in the world. So I'm going to give you a quick one minute snippet from Tesla history because I was sitting there on the board and chaired the audit committee. And then I'm going to close with my two favorite slides. I want to make the case that the future is happening faster than we understand. A lot of you remember the EV1. It was the first real electric car that got any attention and a movie came out because General Motors had the good judgment to take all 600 of them in the middle of the night, crush them, pull them off the market, and uh, ushered in the movie, Who Killed the Electric Car? It looked like a wild conspiracy, but it wasn't. It's a crappy product. It had a range of 70 miles. Slowest thing on the road. I'm not even going to comment on the looks. Fast forward, just 16 years, Tesla rolls out this vehicle. It's the safest car ever tested by NHTSA. It is... Number one in Consumer Reports, Auto World's Company of the Year, literally electric cars went from irrelevant to being the best sellers within a short period. And now the Model uh, 3, biggest selling car in America is usually a Toyota Corolla or a Honda Accord, 265, 70,000 units. This thing, the Model 3, which is starting to roll out on the streets like crazy in Northern California, and you will see it here within a month or two all over, has 500,000 orders before they even put one in a storeroom. Twice what has been sold by a car, almost twice, in US history. And right behind it, starting this year, you are seeing companies like Mercedes put out high-end autonomous vehicles. By the way, if you're looking inside it, there is no steering wheel in this thing. If you're worried about, like, is it going to bump into something, you want to jump up to the front seat and take the wheel, you're out of luck, there is no wheel. <laughs> this is coming 
faster than you realize. Ford has said they'll put fully autonomous vehicles on the road in 2021. We've just invested in the LiDAR company. We see these all over in Silicon Valley. This is the future, and we can talk more about that in a minute. The point is, it's happening right before our eyes. So what I want to leave you with is this notion that the inflection point is coming. Who knows what city this is? Anybody recognize this? New York City. Fifth Avenue, Easter Day Parade, 1900. You get the gist of it. Horse-drawn wagons everywhere. That's all people can imagine, except if you look really closely, there's one, one internal combustion vehicle. And you know what people are thinking, who is that nut job with that thing? And it's belching smoke, and it goes three miles an hour, and it's, it's an eyesore. 12 years later, 13 years later, New York City, same day, same street, Easter Day Parade. It's a whole new world. All the streets are paved. Horses are gone. We've entirely moved from a horse-drawn economy to internal combustion vehicles in 13 years. And I will tell you, if we can move that quickly in 1900, think what is going to happen in 2018 for the next five years. We are in the middle of a global shift and change in the economy like no one has ever seen. And that brings us to this. California is still the future. What makes us great? What makes us the world's sixth largest economy? It is four things. We have the world's best universities right here. UCLA, USC, Caltech, Berkeley, Stanford, we are reshaping the world. Second, we've got risk capital that will fund young people to take new ideas and turn them into a reality. Third, and make no mistake about this, I hope Washington is listening, we have an immigrant population here that is driving our economy further than anybody understands. <laughs> Folks, 71% of all workers, tech workers in Silicon Valley, are immigrants, including my wife. Over 50% of the CEOs that take companies public on NASDAQ today are immigrants. This is our secret sauce. And the fourth thing, California understands that we are remaking the future. That is our destiny. There has never been a better time to be an entrepreneur. If any of you have business plans, bring them to me now. We are charting a new destiny in this state, and we will continue to keep California at the forefront of creating a new resource economy. Thank you. So, Bear with me for a minute. Commissioner Peterson is an extraordinary person and is going to talk about how we keep California at the forefront of 21st century governance. David said I could just do two or three questions. Anything you want is fair game. Stock tips on Tesla, what it's like to work with an Austrian bodybuilder governor. It's all fair game. Does anybody have a quick question or two? I saw a hand somewhere, don't be bashful. Sir, go ahead. Just go ahead and stand up and belt it out. Sir, sir right here. Go ahead. Any? Chip, please. Did anybody not hear that? So um, the question is, should we still be buying Tesla stock? First, I must provide a disclaimer. I no longer serve on the board, and we've distributed um, our shares, so I have no um, biases or dog in the hunt. Here is what I will tell you. The standard wisdom is Tesla's market cap uh, close to, I think, 50, 45, 50 billion. It's overpriced. They're not producing that many cars. And my god, I've read how much money they're losing. It all sounds scary. It's not. 
the company did, I think, over $9 billion in revenue last year. This year, looking to do 13 or 14. It's growing at almost 40 or 50 percent a year. There's no auto company on the planet that shows anything near that level of growth. Second, Tesla makes money on every car that rolls off the assembly line. They've got higher gross margins than any auto company in the world today. Third, unlike other auto companies, and this is what you need to understand, Tesla's been really investing in the future. They were the first ones to build the Gigafactory because in the future, the competitive advantage in the vehicles is partly the technology and the software. The other part is the battery, and they're working very hard to be a low-cost provider. That is why their market is so high. You should also know they've been for most or much of the last five years the most shorted stock on Wall Street, and they've continued to go like that. People who have bet against Tesla have lost their shirt. Now, what does the next three or four years look like? I do not know. What I can tell you is the other auto companies have woken up. They are all moving electric. And I'm actually flying to Germany next week to meet with Volkswagen and so on and so on to talk about how immediate this issue is. They realize there is a near-death experience before them. But the real issue is who will own the autonomous vehicle market? And that will determine who the next giant companies are in the future. Um, one more question. I um, thought I saw one more hand. Steve, I've got the mic. So, Sir. Um, my question for you. And then we'll come to you, and then we'll bring uh, Commissioner Peterson up. Go ahead. Steve, my question for you is what three questions should we be asking the governor candidates in the next election, drawing upon your experience in state government, drawing upon your message today? What are the three most important questions we should be asking the gubernatorial candidates? Well, I was hoping for some tougher questions uh, today, but <laughs> let's just jump right into that. Um, so, David didn't mention it. I served as the controller and chief financial officer for the state of California. I ran for governor in 2006. I lost by uh, four points. So I'm somewhat familiar with the concept of running for governor. I don't care what party you are. These are the three issues you ought to ask. Number one, our pensions are seriously out of balance. What will you do to make sure that California can maintain uh, the solvency of our pension funds because that is the single thing that most puts our budget at risk. I used to serve as the CFO of the state. When Gray Davis was removed from office, Governor Schwarzenegger came in and said, Steve, how bad is it? And I said, <laughs> we had like 141 days before insolvency. And I just want you to ponder this. World's fifth largest economy, mismanaged budget, that can trigger a global recession. We are better than that, but our candidates need to speak to how they will make our pension funds solvent. They are 33% unfunded today at historic highs in the stock market. It could likely drop to under 50%. They must speak to that. It is a hard question to answer. I can answer it, but I'll do that later. Second. We must have accountability in our public schools. Over 40% of the state's budget goes to K through 12, but our schools do not compete effectively with the best schools in the world in Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Finland. This is not a political issue. It is simply an issue of best practices. We need more accountability in our public schools. I am a huge fan of public schools, but until we raise the bar for our teachers and students, it is the entire educational process, it is hard to get the money we need to stay on top. Number three, we must invest in the infrastructure of the future. The single biggest return on taxpayer dollar comes on infrastructure. In the old days, we all knew what it looked like. Roads, bridges, airports, rail, they're important. And McKinsey will tell you exactly what the return is on each of those. But as we move into the future, we need elected officials that understand this stuff. We need to be investing in a digital highway so that every Californian, including those who grew up in East LA and South Central LA, can take part in the global economy. We need to be talking about Hyperloop. We need to be talking about making autonomous vehicles part of the public infrastructure. We need to be investing in simple terms in the infrastructure of the future. And if you look at those fastest growing firms in the world, Tesla, Uber, 
every one of them except for one, is California-based. That's why we're the future. We just need a candidate for governor who understands that. There is no better segue to bring on Commissioner uh, Peterson to talk about how we can keep California on top in government. Thank you. Good to see you. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> It's my pleasure to be here with you. Again, I'm Carla Peterman, and I'm a commissioner with the California Public Utilities Commission. And I'll start off by saying, um, I see the same vision of the world that Steve does. Uh, I can't say I see us getting to free electricity anytime soon, uh, but that's a good goal to aspire to. And I see that same vision because of California's leadership. And Steve and I are both responding to that same leadership signal. So when you talk about how does California stay ahead, how does California keep pace with technologies and making sure that our policies accommodate, particularly technologies that lead to this low carbon future, it starts at the top. And our governor, uh, various governors, our legislatures have consistently made air pollution reduction and greenhouse gas reductions a key priority. Every year, we up our goals. So now we have a state goal to get to 40% below our 1990 level emissions by 2030. And the CPUC is considering a decision right now for the electric sector that would set an emissions target for that sector to actually get to 61% uh, below 1990 levels. Governor Brown came out last week with a new executive order and an initiative on zero emission vehicles that I'm sure everyone's been talking about. And we had the most aggressive goal in this area in the country before this executive order. We did have a target of 1.5 million ZEVs on the road by 2030. 2025. Now that goal is 5 million zero emission vehicles on the road by 2030. And when a governor sets direction like that, then that gives direction for agencies like mine to go on and do the work to implement the programs to make this happen. So first you've got to have that executive leadership, then you've got to trust your bureaucracy, trust your expertise. And that's something I think we've also noticed there could be more of at this time. And so what does that mean? I'll say the PUCs, if you're looking about where policy is being done that's leading to zero emissions, look to your state regulatory bodies. The California PUC is at the center of all the movements that Steve was talking about. We were the first commission to approve large-scale uh, utility procurement of energy storage. Um, <coughs> when I issued a ruling directing this procurement in 2013, I got feedback that some people literally fell out of their chairs. They did not believe it. Here we are. 10 years ago, we had 25 megawatts of uh, non-pumped hydro battery storage on the grid. The PUC currently has approved or is in the process of approving over 900 megawatts. We're at the point where we're seeing more energy storage be procured just in regular solicitations, not even in the targeted programs that we have. We're also increasingly at the center of the discussion around zero emission vehicles and zero emission vehicles infrastructure. When I took over leadership of our electric vehicle work at the commission in 2014, the utilities were prohibited from investing in this space. We were concerned about the competitive impact of their involvement. We lifted that prohibition December 2014. A week later, we got an application from a utility to invest in charging. To date, we've approved over $200 million in investments in electric vehicle charging, and we're currently considering an additional billion more that we'll decide on this spring. This is again a space where we see the utilities having leadership and being able to make a difference. And then finally, I'll just mention our work on uh, the integrated resource planning. Again, as we're thinking about how do you optimize this grid, how do you bring all these products together, they have to be orienting towards something. And so our integrated resource uh, planning process has set up an optimal portfolio for the utilities. What would the optimal mix of resources be if we want to reach our greenhouse gas goals? While doing that, we're sending signals to the market about what type of investments we see going forward. Now, that's what you would expect us to be involved in, given the conversations we've had. But I want to highlight a couple of other areas of work that we're doing and where California has led in order to make this transition sustainable. And the first is on build out of broadband infrastructure. Some of you may not know, but the PUC manages funds to build broadband infrastructure across the state. 
when we talk about the interconnected universe and the Internet of Things, there's an assumption that you have access to the Internet. And not all Californians have that. We, see, we still see a real disparity in rural communities. We have that benefit of having a very unique topography in California, where it's very hard to get access sometimes in the hills and the rural areas. We've seen a lack of access in Native American communities. And so we need to keep building this basic infrastructure if we expect all Californians to participate in this system. Related, we're also seeing that these resources are not necessarily available in disadvantaged communities. And so one thing that you'll notice in every piece of leadership you're seeing come out of the legislature now, the Public Utilities Commission, the governor, there is attention to disadvantaged communities. We just approved several um, transportation projects for our utilities, and particularly investments in medium heavy duty infrastructure. The majority of them are in disadvantaged communities. We set a target for the charging that the utilities are investing in to get to 10% of that charging in disadvantaged communities. We're seeing 20 to 40% of that investment go there. I think what that is showing us is that if you make it a requirement, people are able to exceed it. Sometimes the biggest barrier is just focusing your attention. And so what California needs to do is continuously look at these areas and identify what are the barriers and put out challenges to agencies like ours to address them. And I'll just wrap up by talking about one of the opportunities I'm particularly excited about related to energy storage. Uh, and again, Steve is right about the tremendous impact that battery cost declines is going to have on the grid. And we just adopted a decision at the commission to allow energy storage facilities to provide multiple services. So you have one device, and that can provide benefits to a customer behind the meter. That can provide grid services. We've never had to have rules in place for something like that before, because we've never had technologies that have the capacity to do that. And that's an example of how policy has to respond to technologies. Because we all kept hearing uh, energy storage, all these possible benefits, all these possible revenue streams. But it turns out there's not rules in place to access those revenue streams, and there's not a policy construct to support them. So we've adopted 11 rules that will enable energy storage to provide services to the grid that are time differentiated, capacity differentiated, and even simultaneous. The potential actually to have one resource provide reliability services to the grid as well as provide customer benefits. Now that's new for us, that's new for everyone, but you have to start somewhere. And so I'm looking forward to that point. We just adopted these rules and we've not seen a multi-use application project come online yet. But what I will consider a success is that in a couple years this becomes commonplace. That it becomes commonplace for one resource to be able to access and stack these multiple revenue streams. So we as a state and as policy leadership need to adapt not only our policy signals, but also our entire market rules to make sure that we're providing all the support and framework that we need for these technologies to come forward. So thank you and I look forward to our discussion. Great. Can I? Let me just add two things to that to be provocative, and I'd love to get uh, Commissioner Peterman's response and, and invite you uh, to jump in. We may have a little disagreement. I, I mentioned this issue that someday electricity could be nearly free. Uh, this isn't just my opinion or kind of what the Sierra Club's thinking. There's actually an initiative, a group of companies, a group of utilities that has formed something called the Free Electron Initiative. And these utilities, I know about this because they are, many of them are, are investors, are saying the time is coming when electricity may in fact be free. And for a utility to say that is a dramatic thing. The follow-on is, so we better wake up and get smart about new businesses we can be moving into. And at just the time, they like to say the, barrier, uh, the barbarians are at the gate and they're you know, losing customers to solar and wind and so on, biggest opportunity in the world has just arrived, which is an era of electric vehicles. So the challenge before us is can we get super smart regulators like Commissioner Peterman who understand how to regulate the future. I just have to give you one other story. And this will explain and paint a picture of how fast things are moving. I used to teach on the faculty at Stanford's Graduate School of Business. My lord, it is frightening because these people are so smart and you're supposed to be in charge and you're the professor and they're all, you're thinking, my God, you're 25 people way smarter than I am. And I just, I remember going around the room and the first person said, well, I'm magna cum laude from Harvard. And I'm thinking, oh boy. 
and the next person was Phi Beta Kappa from Yale and so on. And I got to about the fifth person and they said, accounting major, San Francisco State. And I was thinking, huh, good for that, good for that young, young. And I chatted with him later and I was like, you know, what are you doing? He said, I envision a world where there is immediate frictionless currency transfer and we can do without national currencies. And I was thinking, oh, good luck, pal. Uh, <laughs> let me try getting a job at Wells Fargo or Goldman Sachs first and kind of work it up from there, son, and good luck. Um, he founded something called Ripple. And his net worth, not his company's net worth, his net worth today is $59 billion. He just passed Larry Ellison. California's motto should be, if you can imagine it, we can build it. It is all happening here now. I want you to be part of it, but we need people like Commissioner Peterman to put the regulations in place to manage it properly. If we do that, there will be no stopping California. I agree. And I'll <laughs> Yes, I, I, I do agree that smart people like me do make all the difference. Um, <laughs> Go Bears! <laughs> we have a nice little Cal Stanford here uh, thing going on. And, you know, I think you've picked up on the sophistication and the nuance that we have to start applying when we're thinking about energy. Because although the cost of generation could get down to zero, where we're seeing cost increase really come from transmission. Right? And as well as investments in the distribution system. Your friendly neighborhood pole um, needs to get replaced. And we're having that conversation. Do you replace it with wood? Do you replace it with steel to be fire resistant? And so now that we have, I think, successfully taken on the generation challenge, we need to talk about all these other cost pressures. So what's really exciting on transmission, thinking out the box, is not just figuring out how do you build cheaper transmission, it's how do we not build transmission at all? And I've been really impressed by the fact that during my six years on the commission, more and more I'm starting to see uh, with applications for transmission lines withdrawn because the energy efficiency programs that we've put in place have reduced the expected load. And so we need to think about that. When we look at energy storage, there are opportunities for storage to replace transmission. And so that's what I mean about leadership because we could have sit back on our laurels and say, okay, we've done this, we've done energy storage, we've done renewables, um, but we don't. We meet regularly at agencies and say, what's left on the table? We did, you're talking about integrating vehicles into the grid. We did a vehicle grid integration uh, paper in 2012 and a roadmap with joint agencies in 2013 to see what the opportunity could be. When the time came where we could actually actualize it, and at the moment we're working with the Energy Commission, on a vehicle grid integration working group where we actually have stakeholders from all around the world coming together to figure out what type of communication standards do we need to put in place for these vehicles to be talking to the grid. Now people told us, you don't need to worry about that at first. Um, we just need to make sure these vehicles drive. But the lesson I'm trying to follow now, which we didn't in solar, is thinking about what does the end game look like? We don't want these vehicles just to drive, we want them to provide grid services. And we didn't do that with solar PV. We now know that with smart inverters, solar PV can not only do generation, but provide voltage support, actually support our reliability. Imagine if we had required or had been able to require smart meters when the first PV system went in. What costs might we be saving? How might we be more fully, uh, more fully using these assets? So as we go forward, we need to go back and constantly re-examine our assumptions about what these technologies to do, because the sky is the limit. Any questions? Don't be shy. Any questions or are we all dazzled? Please. Hi, my name is Conway Gibson and I'm actually visiting from Miami. Um, so I want to say in California, we're actually doing some of the management right down the street. Great. Yeah, 
much of the money to do the innovation for this is coming from that vehicle and work placement is not going to be at the same level, or do you believe it will be at the same level and then how does that happen? So what is the future of work given autonomous nature and then how is regulation going to keep up with that if the dollars are linked to job creation and job creation is not the outcome of the sustainable work? So, do you want to go first? or? Sure, I'll, I'll take a, a shot at that. First, you put your finger on the issue of the day. I believe the number one job of government, other than protecting us at the national level, is getting serious about workforce development. Part of the reason we have such a disparate nature in income equality is we have not provided everybody with equal access to education. We need to change that. New technologies make it easier than ever before to give people in disadvantaged areas a same shot at jobs of the future using things like artificial intelligence, cognitive uh, uh, science, to give people in schools that have been traditionally underfunded a chance to get degrees and opportunities that they've never had before. Second, the state needs to get very involved in providing people education uh, and long-term career retraining because I cannot promise you that autonomous vehicles will not obsolete a lot of jobs. They will. By the way, number one job description in the United States today is driver. Between UPS, pizzas, mail, it's a lot of people, taxis. And I can't change it. A lot of those jobs are going away. The state of California needs to be a leader in saying, here is our plan to retrain the next generation of people to be job worthy. And by the way, not just to go to work for government or big companies, but to understand how to be an entrepreneur so you can help create, people like you can help recreate your own future. And I'll just add, looking at this question about how the transition to the low carbon economy affects the general economy is an important one. One of the other uh, four initiatives that Governor Brown announced last Friday is a new initiative called the Climate and Solutions Initiative. And that's $35 million that's going to research on technologies that reduce greenhouse gases. But a part of that is also going to specifically research what the impact of the transition to this economy is on jobs now. And so I think first and foremost, you have to keep that issue top of mind and not shy away from it. You have to invite the unions, you have to invite labor to be a part of the initial planning discussions because they actually, for example, have the most experience with the current technology. Yeah. And so they can tell you how to improve it. But the other point I wanna make is you hit on something which is problematic, which is tying our research dollars in this space to economic development, which is something that California primarily does not do. We have public interest energy research. Uh, we have the EPIC program, which is managed by the Energy Commission. And we just approved a decision two weeks ago for $555 million in research funds over the next three years to that agency. Um, so it's important to make sure that you're having dedicated funds in that space so they're not in conflict with economic development. I want to take the privilege of asking the audience to thank our, our plenary speakers right now catch them in the hallway, catch each other in the hallway, and let the next generation get ready to come in for their awards. There are four panels going on, parking reimagined, business case for smart cities, multimodal transportation, solar system siting in about 15 minutes. But let's give a thank you to our incredible speakers.